Welcome, my name is Charles Abramson and I'm a Regents Professor of Psychology at Oklahoma State University and Lawrence Hill Boger Professor of International Studies. I hold adjunct appointments in the Department of Zoology and the Department of Entomology and Plant Pathology. I'm a comparative psychologist with over 30 years of experience and I've worked with animals uh, ranging from ants to elephants to humans in a wide variety of applied and basic research uh, questions. As a working definition of comparative psychology, I offer you this. It's a branch of psychology that seeks out and studies the similarities and differences in the behavior of organisms. And don't make the mistake that comparative psychology only studies animals. Far from it. Here's something written in 1913, a year before World War I, by Walter Hunter, comparing the performance of animals, a wide variety of animals, by the way, and children. So if you were to ask me what are some of the more inter interesting things in my career, I would point to many things. One is working with a honeybee one day, an elephant the next, and a human on the third day. I've also worked with honeybees to study problems of alcoholism, and I'm part of a research team investigating the molecular mechanisms of learning in two honeybee subspecies. It's a very, very exciting life. At the PhD level, the typical jobs will be university and college professor where we do teaching and research, supervise students. You'll find us in psychology, in sociology, in departments of biology, zoology, entomology, in schools of agriculture, animal science, and veterinary medicine. It's a degree at the PhD level that will allow you to work in many kinds of jobs in academia, not to mention in the business world. If earning a PhD is not your interest at this point, though, I would recommend that you would do that and you uh, would like to end at the master's or bachelor's level, you can also find jobs. Some of these jobs you can do at least some research and some teaching. You'll find them in zoos, wildlife sanctuaries, pharmaceutical companies, veterinary clinics, uh, even major companies such as Petco and PetSmart where you're not working on the floor, but you're actually developing products and uh, testing products. You can also get a job as a behavioral analyst because you're going to have a unique set of skills working with so many different organisms. In addition to a behavioral analyst, you can also work in the areas of human-animal interactions. For example, you can use, uh, you, you can work with a veterinarian to uh, use pets in therapy such as equine therapy. You can also do therapy on pets. Think of the horse whisperer, the dog whisperer, the turtle trainer. And you can do what I've done, is form your own company where you test pet products and develop products for, for animals. I also want to mention that the skills that you'll have related to critical thinking and problem solving ability are almost unparalleled and be of value to any employer. Consider what it takes just for, just for a comparison of a honeybee and an ant. The subject variables you have to consider, environmental variables, experimental variables, dependent variables, independent variables, is the behavior you're looking to compare analogous or homologous. And these are questions that you're trained as a comparative psychologist to answer. And once again, don't make the mistake that you're just studying animal behavior. This can easily be different cultures. It does not have to be restricted to animals. If you'd like to pursue a PhD in comparative psychology, there are several things that you can do to prepare you for graduate school. One of them is to take courses in introductory psychology, quantitative methods, history, experimental, cross-cultural psychology. You should also take courses with the word comparative in the title, comparative religion, comparative anatomy and physiology, comparative politics, comparative philosophy are all very important courses to take. As comparative psychology is a natural science, you should also take courses in biology, animal behavior, evolution, genetics, and chemistry. In addition to these courses, you should also uh, get some hands-on experience in a laboratory doing uh, bench work and also doing field work. Taking these courses and gaining research experience 
would not only help you get into a good graduate school, but also will tell you whether comparative psychology is right for you. It's, it's not for everybody. Also, it represents a great example of the importance of a liberal arts education, and that should not be underestimated or undervalued. Now that you've been accepted into a, a PhD program, what can you expect? Expect to take anywhere from four to six years. I've had students graduate in three and a half years. I've also had students take a little bit longer. During your master's time, you will be required to take core courses, and of course that depends upon uh, the program. Some of these, for sure, you're going to be taking uh, quantitative research methods. You'll probably be taking cross-cultural, comparative, and maybe even a history class. You'll also be doing uh, research. And eventually this research is going to lead to your master's thesis. And the topic of the thesis will be determined by you, your advisor, and your committee. Once you've done that research project and you've successfully defended it, now you move on to your PhD. In the PhD, you'll be taking more courses, but not of the type that you had as a master's student. Many of these courses you might consider uh, electives. Our students can take courses in animal science, in the zoology department, in uh, philosophy if they choose to do so. There will also be a heavy component of research hours. You're going to be doing research quite a bit. Eventually, you'll pass a qualifying examination or a comprehensive examination. In our program, you can either do it uh, through a major review paper or a several hour exam. Once you've passed this, you begin your dissertation project once again in concert with your advisor and your, uh, your committee. And once that is done, you successfully pass it, you're now a, uh, a successful PhD. Some of the research topics we've had for our uh, students with dissertations include timing in, uh, in vertebrates and also in horses. There's also been some work on learning in rattlesnakes, how it relates to defensive behavior. And something you may not consider a comparative topic is uh, developing training techniques to teach general aviation pilots how to land their airplane in a maneuver called the landing flare. Yeah. With regards to other learning experiences that you have in graduate school, one of them is that you should learn how to construct apparatus and use microcontrollers. Often you're not going to find a formal course. You're going to either learn from your advisor, fellow students, or on your own. For example, here's an apparatus called a train -a tray for planarians or flatworms. You cannot buy this anymore. So if you knew how to use a 3D printer, one of our colleagues, Brady Phelps from uh, South Dakota State University, made a 3D printer version. It's not all complete, as you can see. In terms of microcontrollers, it's a very important skill. You can do experiments literally in the palm of your hand for about $100 rather than you know, several thousand that it would normally take. You also should publish, uh, learn how to publish the results of your work. In my view, you need at least three publications to be competitive for an academic job. If you can always be working on your manuscript, always have one submitted, and always have one in press, you will always be productive throughout your career, even as your life as a graduate student. You should also learn how to write grants. This is a very, very important skill. It'll help you get a job, and once you obtain the job, it'll help you keep the job. You can either do this by uh, taking a grant writing course, or you can learn from your, uh, from your advisor. There are many grants that you uh, can apply for. I would certainly recommend a, a National Science Foundation pre-doctoral fellowship, and then once you're close to graduating, a uh, postdoctoral fellowship. There's also many private uh, foundation grants that you can uh, obtain. Sigma Xi, Fulbright, uh, f many, many different kinds of organizations. Coca-Cola company also give out money. Also, try to become a graduate student representative on a job hiring, a faculty hiring committee. It's an eye-opener. It's also a good experience to show you what you can expect when you start, on, you start uh, going on the job market. Also, network and go to conferences and introduce yourself. Talk to other comparative psychologists. That becomes very, very important. You never know what kind of opportunities are going to arise from just meeting other comparative psychologists. And finally, as comparative psychology really is a cross-cultural psychology, I would recommend that you uh, try to find a time to learn a foreign language. You might find that your work will lead you to other countries as it has with, uh, with mine. 
and by knowing the language, it'll make data collection easier, and also it'll just be uh, a more enjoyable experience interacting with people in their own language. At the high school level, my best advice would be for you to read the work of a contemporary comparative psychologist and contact us. You can contact us uh, by just looking at the bottom of an article and you'll find our, our information. I get requests all the time from students at all levels of the educational system about comparative psychology and we're always happy to answer those, those questions. If your high school permits you to take college classes, many do, I'd certainly recommend that you take a course with the word comparative in the title. That'll really give you a nice idea. Also try to volunteer at laboratories in, at your local uh, college or uh, university. Take advantage of summer science academies. That's also a nice way to know whether this is what you would like to do. In terms of uh, college, there are going to be many opportunities for you for research and scholarships at the undergraduate level. First, I'd recommend that you seek out professors, and this may not be the common advice, seek out professors almost as soon as you get on campus. Start your career early. Some people may say, well, you know, it's good to wait till you're a junior or a senior, but then, you know, in some cases it's too late. Because remember, a comparative psychologist has to acquire skills. And the earlier you do that, the better it will be. With regards to scholarships, the number and amount will vary depending on your university. But in general, I think you can always find money from either a professor or one of the scholarship programs to fund your research for at least a semester, if not a year. Our university has many of these programs, and I'm sure that's not, uh, that's not unique. Another program that you uh, should apply for, which is very, very important, is the National Science Foundation Research Experience for Undergraduate Program. This is called NSFREU. It's a summer program where you spend about six weeks or so, all expenses paid, doing some sort of directed research. It's, it's an excellent program. There are even some that, uh, that are international in focus, for example, going to Turkey to conduct research. You can find out a lot of the information about NSFRU by just going to the National Science, uh, Science Foundation website. My advice for prospective graduate students would be the same. Contact professors you may want to work with as early as you can. Try to establish a relationship. Read the articles. Ask questions. Uh, in closing, I'd just like to say if I can offer some advice, uh, feel free to, to contact me. Thank you.